new Bible in front of me. I've got my own version of a NIV Bible. So my apologies. But the, uh, the first Old Testament reading is taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 64, verses 4 to 9. Thank you, John T. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you, who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continued to sin against them, you were angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, Lord, do not remember our sins forever. Oh, look on us, we pray, for we are all your people. The New Testament reading is taken from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. to the elders and the flock. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Alex. Uh, and now I'd like to call uh, Nigel White uh, to give today's sermon. Well, thank you, Nigel. And uh, thank you for inviting me to speak. This is actually the first time I've ever spoken physically in the church, so it's wonderful to be with you. And it's the first time I think I've ever spoken on the same subject in two different churches on the same morning. And it reminds me of our time in Lebanon when, uh, although I can speak Arabic, when we were out there, I always preached in English. And the wonderful thing was you were in the pulpit with someone else translating for you. So it was great because someone was agreeing with everything you said because they said exactly the same thing, just in a different language. So I, I am... Uh, merely repeating really what I said earlier this morning at St. Mary's, which was lovely as well. As you know, these are the studies in 1 Peter, as, as um, Nigel and Jonty pointed out. I think this is the penultimate study in 1 Peter. 
uh, and the studies, the general title of the talks have been how to live as the people of God in a hostile world. And undoubtedly the Christians that Peter was writing to, if you look up, I'd love to have you, if you can have your Bibles open, that would be great, by the way, to, to 1 Peter 5. But if you look back at chapter 1, verse 1, it says, To God's elect strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, uh, Asia, and Bithynia, so present-day Turkey. So these first-century Christians would have, had, would have experienced tremendous persecution, whether physical societal or indeed religious you see one thing we need to understand about first century uh, uh, the roman empire at that time that judaism was officially recognized as one of the legal religions so although jews were not necessarily roman citizens they did at least belong to a religion that was recognized by the empire so if you were a jew who believed in jesus held that jesus was lord and savior you therefore lost that sort of cover you had by being a member of a legal religion. Additionally, whether you were a Jew or a Greek, if you chose to follow Jesus, you were betraying your ancestry. Now, I don't know how much that has sway in 21st century Britain, but I know even in, in 20th and 21st century Lebanon, that was massive. If a, if a Lebanese person or someone of Arab origin changed their belief it was it was it was a great shame on the family as it were a great shame on the community aib haram as it were and so you can imagine that these people that Paul, that peter was talking to were not only ostracized by the people around them they may well have been ostracized by their own families it's a very difficult position to be in i mean john t was talking of seven generations of people in, 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 the, uh, in the clergy, within his family. I mean, so, so th there is, there's no break, as it were. But, but in, in first century uh, um, Turkey, it would have been a very, very big thing for these people to stand up for Christ. And so we come to the fifth chapter of the book of 1 Peter, the first four verses that uh, we just had read to us. And the sermon today, sermon today is entitled, Suffering and Glory in leadership and the, the overarching question is what is our motivation for anything we do what is my motivation for anything I do in chapter 4 verse 11 it says these words if anyone speaks they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God if anyone serves they should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. That should be our motivation. And what if we suffer doing that? Well, let's recap a little of what John T. spoke on last week, the end of chapter 4. John T. spoke of four F's that apply, that, that define our reaction when we face hardship. Fight, flight, freeze, or fold. But John T. added a fifth, didn't he? Said, as Christians, we are encouraged, indeed commanded, to use another F when faced with suffering and hardship, when faced with life, and that is to follow, to follow Jesus' example. And we live in a world where we want everything instantly, don't we? We don't like waiting for things. We want the glory now. But if we are to follow Jesus' example in his life, and as set out by Peter in the very last verse of chapter 4, 13, but rejoice, it's not the last verse, beg your pardon, but rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed suffering leading to glory that is the pattern of jesus's life and so we come to today's passage in these four verses we see a certain group of people addressed directly now you'll see in those verses they are called three different things 
They're called elders, they're called shepherds, and they're called overseers. Now, we don't really have time to go into the ins and outs of each word and whether or not they are different from one another and how this actually plays out in the passage. Suffice it to say that Peter is talking to those who have been given positions of responsibility, roles of leadership in the handful of churches that could be found in Turkey in the first century AD. In terms of the 21st century, well, well, how would this apply to this, to this day and age? Well, of course, this would obviously be a vicar, a rector, a pastor of a church. But I don't think we naturally need to stop there. When we delve deeper into the role of these leaders, I think we can widen the definition to include, say, church wardens, Sunday school, youth leaders, home group leaders, members of the PCC, uh, preachers, service leaders. And some would go so far as to say parents within a Christian home. And that is my one nod to Father's Day today. But again, bear with me as I elaborate on what their role is and whether you actually agree with me. So let's first look at verse 1. This is what it says. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Now, I just want to pick out two small things from that first verse. The word fellow. Did that wash over you the two times you've heard it this morning? Fellow elder. What an amazing thing for Peter. Remember who Peter was to say. He called himself a fellow elder. Not that they were his fellow elders, but that he was their fellow elder. What humility. Peter, the foremost apostle of Jesus Christ, saying that he was a fellow elder with Bob in the little church in a small city in Bithynia. Now, don't worry, I'm not being heretical. Bob isn't actually mentioned here. I was just using it as an example. But it shows the wonderfully humble attitude Peter showed. Why? Why did he have that attitude? Well, you can imagine it. Because he walked around the Judean countryside, the desert, the dusty roads for three years with the king of kings. And then what does that king of kings do the night he is betrayed? He kneels down and washes his feet. That's where he learnt his humility. He was a fellow elder and he goes on to warn them that just because they were elders, they would not escape the sufferings that would come. And they probably already knew that because they were probably experiencing that suffering. I mean, if you think of it, who is it that is first taken from a church? When you hear of these, uh, uh, le- the, these, these uh, churches being persecuted in certain countries, who is taken first? Who is incarcerated first? Well, it is the pastor, the leader. Why? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? As Jesus himself said on the night he was arrested in Matthew 26, he was actually quoting Zechariah 13. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And what will follow that suffering? What does it say at the end of verse 1? Who also will share in the glory to be revealed. The pattern of Jesus' life. And it's picked up again at the end of the passage. Verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, Jesus himself, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. There is no glory without suffering. Why? Because we follow Jesus. The pattern of his life will be the pattern of every true believer's life. And so we come to verses 2 and 3. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest game, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Peter asked them to be shepherds of God's flock. What does it mean to be a shepherd of God's flock? And this is where I derive the fact that we can widen out the definition of who this is relevant to, albeit indirectly. If we look at Mark 6, don't look it up now, but it's a very famous story. Verses 30 to 44. 
Some of you may know what it is. It's entitled The Feeding of the 5,000. And yet we so rarely understand what that actually means. In verse 34, this is what Jesus says in that passage. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And then it says, so he began feeding them loaves and fishes. No, it doesn't. So he began picking up his phone and ordering lots and lots of pizzas from Domino's. It doesn't say that either. I've never noticed it before. It says, so he began teaching them many things. It was after he had taught them, after he had fed them metaphorically, if you like, that he fed them physically. You see, the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, feeds his sheep first by teaching them the word of God. And if you have been given a job as an under-shepherd, a leader within the body of Christ, and remember the passage we heard not many weeks ago when we were talking about Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd. Do you remember the under-shepherds there could have been hired hands? Do you remember it calls them that? And what happens when suffering comes to the hired hands? They run away. That is not what we are meant to be. We are meant to be under-shepherds of the chief shepherd. Of the chief? Of the chief shepherd. So what are we to do? We are to feed his flock and take care of his flock. And we all know what this is referring back to, don't we? We all know the scene on the shores of the Sea of Galilee where Jesus asks Peter three times, do you love me? And we all know why he asked it three times. Because Peter had denied Jesus three times. He asks him three times, do you love me? And all three times, Peter says, yes, I love you. What a wonderful picture of restitution. What a wonderful picture of forgiveness. If he'd only asked one, maybe Peter would have said, well, that's one out the way. What about the other two by that fire? Not many days ago when I denied I knew him. But what does Jesus say in response when Peter says he loves him? Feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. So Peter is saying, be shepherds of God's flock. Feed and take care of those God has entrusted to you. And finally, we are encouraged to interrogate our motives for taking on such leadership roles. Three reasons are given not to take the position on. And they're followed by the three counter reasons to actually do so. Not because you must, not pursuing dishonest gain, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, but eager to serve, but being examples to the flock. Peter encourages the leaders of the churches 2,000 years ago, as he asks us today, to examine our reasons for wanting to lead. Now, what do you find strange about that? What I find strange is these, I feel, apply a lot more to the 21st century than they do the 1st century. I mean, if you're getting kicked about as a leader of the church, you're not thinking about, oh, I'm going to make some money out of this. You're not thinking, oh, look, I'm going to be able to lord it over people. I'm getting a kicking. Isn't it amazing that in the 1st century even, The Lord, through the Holy Spirit, through Peter, was seeing that there was the possibility that as shepherds of the flock, as leaders, that it was open to doing it for the wrong reasons. And so those three reasons again. Is it because you must? Is it only out of a sense of duty? I'm not saying that duty is wrong, but if it is only because of that, I think we need to re-examine ourselves. Is it because of money or wealth? Is it because you're going to become richer doing so? Is it because of the feeling of power? Is it because of your standing in the community? The way you will be able to influence those around you for your own ends? Well, if that is true, I think we need to stop. And I think we need to re-examine why we are doing what we are doing. 
I know that when I was in Lebanon, I had a position of leadership. I was the head teacher of a school of 900 children and 110 staff. And I know that often my motivation was wrong. And I know that God had to humble me and it was very, very difficult. But it was right. And I think we do sometimes need to re-examine our motivations. We need to lead because we are willing. Because we actually want to. Do you sometimes do things because there's no one else? Do you sometimes do things because, well, if I don't do it, no one will do it? Or are you eager? Do you want to do it? And because you want to be an example to God's flock for his glory. To follow Jesus means to suffer for him and for his flock that have been put under your care. And to do so willingly because you want to, not for personal gain. And I'll end with verse 4 again. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away.